looking at Tozer today is kind of sad and tragic in one way and kind of a warning and a wake-up call in another. You see, Tozer today in teaching is talking about the Christian responsibility, but he's also talking about one issue of that responsibility that maybe you find yourself in. I wish I could say I do too, but I don't. Because what happened to me was rather unique, I guess. But not so unique that not others have experienced it. They too have had the same experience. You see, Tozer's talking about how many know God only by hearsay. The whole point of salvation wasn't to save you from hell. That's not why Jesus died. The whole point of salvation was to reveal the Father to you, that you should know God and He whom God had sent, His only begotten Son, that you might know the truth and the truth would set you free, that you would become one of the family of God, that you would know Jesus in a personal intimate way, that He would introduce you to His Father whom God sent, meaning God sent His Son, even though the Father and the Son and the Spirit are one, and they are God, and you may not understand that. The Father asked in heaven, Whom shall I send, and whom will go to represent me? And Jesus said, Here am I, send me. And so when Jesus came, He had a purpose and a design in mind, and it wasn't to save your soul from hell. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, and who there believed in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life, is true. But the reality of eternal life is this, that you would know God. And that, I think, is tragic because, you see, a lot of people talk about God. A lot of religions claim they have God. But me, just for myself, if God didn't intervene in my life, if God wasn't real, I would not be a Christian. If God hadn't proved himself in such a way that I have no doubt, and I don't mean by faith, I mean by direct intervention of God and I, and not just experience, but by faith and experience through the word and by his own voice, then I would not be a Christian. If God had not worked with me and I with him alone and developed a personal relationship, I would not be a Christian. Oh, I would choose some other way. I would have some other philosophy. I would design, as it were, my certain way of dealing with life in such a way that I could make myself feel better. And many have gone out and done that. But if the living God isn't living in you, and if he isn't proving himself to you, you aren't a Christian. You're just religious. And religious is good to a point. Because religion can make you a nice person. It can change your mindset and cause you to deal with people in a different way and make you more acceptable to some people. But if God isn't real, why bother? You have to come to that conclusion according to Tozer and according to me. Because you see, I've had dealings with life, and I found that you will fail in life in the end when you discover that death does not terminate your existence. And that's the problem with all religious ideas, is that it's not a question of coming to the place of death's door and then believing by faith that there's something more. No. That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard, and it's a bad limerick. But rather, it's finding the facts that existence does happen beyond the physical deterioration of the body of flesh, because we have those that have gone before and told us so, Jesus himself. Jesus rose from the dead. If he didn't, why bother? If God himself had not raised Jesus from the dead, then there would be no point for us to have 
religious expression called Christianity. There'd be no reason to have an ongoing relationship with God personally, except that God is real. Because the majority of Christians will go along with Christian ideas without believing in a Christian God that is real. Because they want to have an acceptable means to present themselves before what might be God because they want to hedge their bets. They don't want to have that kind of demonstration of faith that really is absolute because it proves itself by way of fact, not just fancy. So intelligent faith is simply sitting down and having a real demonstrable opportunity to say to God and deal with him on a one-to-one -one basis and say, look, I need to know without a shadow of a doubt that you're real. I need to come to a conclusion between you and I in some way that this thing that people call Jesus and salvation is real. <coughs> I need to deal with you as a living God and find out if there really is an existence beyond this life I see, touch, feel. Because if there is, I need to do something about it. And that's what Tozer is so feeling sad about. that. People have gone the way of putting a facade or a veneer on top of Christianity to make it seem like they have the answers because they use philosophy and philosophical humanistic logic in order to present material that points to God. But does the person know God? I don't want to hear from you if you don't know God. I don't want to follow you if you don't know God. Why would I choose to follow a blind man who stumbles and traps himself in the pit of his own makings and deceptions when he can't see the light that is obvious before him and declare that God is real? If a man cannot determine for himself and sit down and examine with God and discover that there is the living God and that Jesus is real, then why would I bother to listen to him? of the incorruptible God into the image of corruptible man. So there's innate within us God intervening to us in some way that each one of us is accountable for that point in time where God has visited us, where God has made himself known. The reality of what we have done with that in changing the image of the incorruptible God into the image of corruptible man is how we have either deceived ourselves or perceived God in a way that isn't how he presented himself. Because when he wanted to be made known, he sent his son Jesus to reveal to us who the Father is. When Jesus came, the disciples said, just look Jesus, we, we don't get it all. I understand that you, you know, you, you got all this knowledge, and I understand that you got all this wisdom, and I understand that, you know, you say these things, but we don't get it. If you just show us God, if you just show us the Father, it's enough. And Jesus said to them, "If have I been so long with you that you don't know me? I and my Father are one. Boom. Did they get it? Of course not. Any more than I can say to you, God is in you. And you get it. Oh, you might accept it. 
But unless you know God in a personal and intimate way and have had dealings with Him, you don't really know how God is in you. You don't really understand that God is in you. That the words Emmanuel literally mean God in us. That doesn't make any sense. Now, in a <coughs> kind of off-the-wall perspective, I don't mind saying, yeah, Christians are possessed people. They're possessed by God. It's like a God possession instead of a demon possession. Because, you see, the world will accept demon possession, no problem. Oh, yeah, we got that down. We've seen it on TV. But you don't see quite the idea of what a God possession is like. You know, because we've seen cults that mimic what happens when a person is dispossessed of themselves and possessed with this absolute, oh, true believer kind of attitude where they have this facade of joy. But a true Christian, or rather a Christian that knows God, isn't perfect and will be the first to admit it. Because in dealing with God, they see the reality of who they are and know that. And they share that in an intimate, personal way. And they make a difference in lives that way. Because they don't need to be put up on stage so much as they need to allow the light to just shine where they're at. But unfortunately, Tozer reminds us and teaches us something that today we're going to find is tragic. Men and women who are quote-unquote ministers of God who don't in fact know God at all. And that's a tragedy that I, I, I just can't imagine. Why would I follow anyone who doesn't know God personally? In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever does not righteousness is not of God. 1 John 3.10 Do you realize that there are many, many, many in the churches of our day who talk some of the Christian language, but who know God only by hearsay? <coughs> Most of them have read some book about God. They have seen some reflection of the light of God. They may have heard some faint echo of the voice of God, but their own personal knowledge of God is very, very, very slight. Many Christians are shaking or, stock or staking their reputations on church attendance. They're putting themselves into religious activity. They are becoming worship leaders and writing wonderful words without much spirit. Social fellowship and sessions of singing all have brought this easy to be a part of a group, but no individual accountability. Because in all of these things, they are able to lean upon one another to feel as though they were one of what someone else is experiencing. They are vicarious at best Christians and not the living example of Jesus himself. They spend a lot of time serving as religious props for one another in Christian circles, lifting up others, but are they standing alone with God? Let us look at the example of Jesus. When he was here upon earth, the record shows that he had work to do, and he also knew the necessity for activity as he preached and healed, taught and answered questions and bless the people. He also knew the fellowship of his brethren, those who followed him and loved him. But those were the incidental things in Jesus' life compared to his fellowship with and personal knowledge of the Father. And he revealed that to us. When Jesus went to the mountain to pray and to wait on God all night, he was not alone, for he knew the conscious presence of God the Father with him. <coughs> I often teach in this ministry of Vidivo that if you continue on with me one year, that if you would just do your devotionals daily, that if you listen to the words that are said and operate according to the things that are taught, then you would hear God's voice speak to you. That God would speak to you audibly through your ears because he promised. 
He said that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But he said, my sheep hear my voice and they know me. Now, I would like to tell you, like many pastors will, that simply reading the word of God is hearing the voice of God. It's not. It's not. When Jesus said it in the context that he said it, he didn't mean read the Bible because we're already told to study to show ourselves approved. We're told to think about these things. We're told to let these words of let the word dwell richly in you. Uh, meditate on these words day and night. When thou rise up, when thou sit down, when thou walkest on the way, when thou goest, when thou you know, and on and on and on. There are lots of things about the written word that we are told to do. But the interesting thing is that Jesus said, "My sheep hear my voice." He spoke as though the communicative capability would be there of the Spirit of God to open our ears that we might hear what the Spirit is saying, not just understand and not just read. There comes a time where God will say, have you heard me and have you done the things I said? Daily, God calls to us to meet with him, to choose to walk with him, to choose to be the people of not the book but of the way and Jesus in personifying the way was the way of the master no the way of the son no but the way of an intimate God dealing with an intimate father as an intimate father dealt with an intimate son they communicated to each other on a daily basis Adam was capable and able to walk in the cool of the day with God himself alone and I don't know what your day is like and I don't know what your world is but I know that if you don't know God in a personal way you aren't saved if you don't have a relationship with Jesus you aren't saved if you're following someone who's teaching you about the religious way or the religious things and doesn't have a personal contact with God in some way they aren't saved and you're following a fool the one reason I always enjoyed Chuck Smith more than any other person in the world that I've ever met when he was teaching was that when I sat down there, and I sometimes was down at the front row in the front of the pews laying on the carpet, that I would look at the man's face when he wasn't looking at me. You know, looked at me, I, 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 but I look at the man's face and I'd listen to his words and I'd watch him speak, and it sounded and looked like as if he had just come from talking to God. And sometimes I felt that way. And you know, if that's not the way our relationship with God is we ought to examine our salvation and make sure proof of our calling because we need to find if we are found in the faith before we find out that we're not 